being recorded. Our first speaker in the series on April 6th was Noah Malach, a research at Western Critical Zone Observatory. April 13th, we had Jeff McDonald and John Bolte at Oregon State. This week, we'll introduce Fred Scatina, University of Pennsylvania. Next week, we'll have Anthony Alftenkamp, uh, Stroud Water Research Institute. Um, this series is, is intended to familiarize our audiences with the various research initiatives that are going on around the country. Um, we've been privileged throughout the year to see a variety of different facilities, research opportunities, and from California up to um, Penn State, and another one here out of Pennsylvania. But this is related to the Lukio Critical Zone Observatory, linking lithology to critical zone processes. Um, we'll get an introduction to the location, but the speaker is Fred Scatina. He's University of Pennsylvania, and we're just talking. We're both, this is Todd Rasmussen. Um, I'm at the University of Georgia, and we were both Peace Corps volunteers back in the late 70s. Uh, Fred was at the Dominican Republic. I was in Honduras. Um, he's been at the uh, Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania about 10 years now. But in his background, he's been at the um, International Institute of Tropical Forestry in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, as well as a consulting hydrologist and geomorphologist. Um, he's got quite a bit of experience down in the Caribbean, so it's a real pleasure today to introduce Fred and hear what he has to say about the CZO at Lukito. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today and share a little bit of what we're doing in the Lukito Critical Zone Observatory. I'm really in the focus of a lot of the research is linking lithology to critical zone processes. And we're taking a look at the Lukio Mountains in that first slide. What I want to do is first give an overview to the area, talk a little bit about the environmental and the geologic framework, um, then talk about the conceptual framework that we're all working under. There's a number of scientists there. We have a, a general framework of linking this lithology to critical zone processes. Then we'll start actually from the top of the mountain to the bottom and talk about different projects that are going on and, again, how these contrast between the rock types um, from atmospheric inputs to soil to streams, ultimately down to the coastal plain. And then as I do that, I'll hopefully give you some insight into some of the techniques and the cross-site information we have as well as some of the infrastructure. And then we'll get down to emerging views and what we have, I think, what's coming up from some of these ideas. Let me say that we are in the Lokio Mountains in northeastern Puerto Rico. Um, I claim this is the prettiest of all the critical zone observatories, or LTERs. Um, and if you don't believe that, you can invite me to your site, and we can uh, we can figure that out. We are in the in the Greater Antilles, and you can see from the one side on your lower right that we're in the middle of the hurricane belt. So much really can't, you can't understand the forest itself without thinking about hurricanes, hurricane impacts, pulsating uh, storm events. Likewise, we're also, you can't think about the site to really understand it without having some idea about uh, general tectonics. Uh, we're on the, the Puerto Rican Trench. In fact, the deepest part in the Atlantic is right off of the north coast. Here's Puerto Rico in this area. We're right in the corner there. Um, and mostly slight strict tectonics is actually what's been driving the patterns as we go. I want to give a little bit background into the geology of the area, um, because lithology is the central theme of the talk. And without going into a great deal of the geologic history, um, we basically have three major rock types which we're interested in. Uh, volcanoclastic rock, a quartz diorite, and a hornfels. And if we start out at the bottom panel here, the initial conditions were the volcanoclastic rocks, they all came from a very similar andesitic magma source, um, late Cretaceous, early Eocene um, activity. 
The volcanic clastics were the volcanic deposits that were deposited into a shallow marine environment. Later on, the intrusive um, quartz diorite entered those volcanic clastic rocks and then baked the blue as the hornfell outside rim of that, the contact metamorphic rocks. All that has been actually uplifted and eroded away, and so what we have now is basically three major rock types, the hornfells, which are the ridge formers, the quartz diorites, which um, are the central sandy batholitic material, and the volcanic clastics. A lot of the questions that we're dealing with in the critical zone is really how these three rock types differ um, in terms of their critical zone processes. And I'll show that um, as we go. If we look at the landscape of Luquillo, this is a three-dimensional view of the Luquillo Mountains coastal plain being surrounded. Um, the quartz diorites are in one watershed, and that actually is there some of the fastest eroding rocks I've known. Um, in fact, one reason why it's more of a valley is because they erode quickly. The hornfells, the contact metamorphic hornfells, tend to be the ridge formers, and then the volcanoclastics um, are, are much more common in terms of area, and um, they form these other watersheds. As you go up from the coast, you have increased um, rainfall, which shows here. Um, you have increased runoff. Um, it's all forested. This is all part of a national forest. Um, and so what makes a nice condition is that you have three, three lithologies in four forest types and a climatic range. And so you can actually use this natural laboratory um, extending from the coast all the way up um, to look at the combinations between rock type and climate, um, whole climate constant, very rock type, whole rock type constant, very climate, um, to get at these basic ideas of what the, um, how the influence of lithology affects critical zone material. And this is our general conceptual model. And if you just look at these two streams, this is the quartz diorite. As I mentioned, they came from the same, very similar, basically the same andesitic magma source. Um, so their bulk chemistry is relatively similar. But their cooling history was different. And so the quartz diorite cooled longer. It's basically produced, uh, cooled all the way to quartz. And basically it weathers to quartz. And so your streams are, there's a great deal of quartz and sand in the soils, up to 60%. Um, and, the and the streams are very sandy. Adjacent, and this other picture here is in the volcanic caustics. Note both of these get similar rainfalls, similar elevations. The volcanic caustics um, weather to clays and then large core stones. And the clays wash out very quickly. And so what you get in the streams, there's basically very little sand and you get these boulders with very kind of clean streams with very little material in between. That's kind of the dra dramatic difference between the two. The overall question that we're linking our research to is how do critical zone processes, water balances, mass fluxes, differ in landscapes with contrasting lithology, but similar climatic and environmental histories? So you can keep, con everything is forested, land use history is the same, Hur hurricane disturbances have been relatively similar, um, but your big difference is lithology. And so you can change, go up and down and change um, climate or rock type and hopefully the tweez these apart. And I'll be giving you some, exper some examples of that. One of the keys for us, though, is that we have a whole range of different scientists, and this is a nice unifying theme. So the geochemists are looking at how weathering varies between these two rock types, what's the rates of weathering, what's, what materials are being formed. The biogeochemists and the hydrologists are much more interested in looking at the mass fluxes, where the internal cycles going on, the biological controls versus abiological controls provides a nice link to what the geochemists are doing. Stream scientists, obviously looking at the difference in channel behavior. The aquatic ecologists for the year, for years have seen 
differences between these streams. When we go down to the coast, we can look at differences between sandy and uh, coastal, sandy and clay coastal zones or deltas. Um, and then our cosmogenic dating group is also trying to get a handle on how these landscapes erode through time. So it's been it's provided a very nice unifying theme for what we do. Give you a little sense of how our design is. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to stop from top to bottom. We actually have two major watersheds. One, they're very similar in size. They start up at the top of the mountain. Um, one drains of volcanic clastics. The other drains of quartz diorite. Uh, the two pictures I've shown you actually are from one stream and the other. We have a set of climate stations that cover both areas, up and down. Um, but it's really a set of paired watershed, nested and paired watersheds. Um, headwater streams on both sides that are paired, then mid-elevation streams, and then finally some, some USGS gauges, gauges at the bottom. So we have this nested design. Some of this work actually started previously. Um, some of the gauges are managed by the Forest Service and by USGS. Um, the critical zone has been adding to that. Um, kind of being a unifier of these groups, doing different things in the past. Um, and let me just show you. The next picture is more of a picture of a trade winds view. And here again are the Lokio Mountains. And we're looking at pretty much of the dominant trade winds come out. And this is our volcanoclastic watershed. This is our quartz diorite watershed. Say one thing that um, many people don't realize, but this is a national forest. It's part of the USDA National Forest uh, Reserve. It was actually one of the first national forests. And during the Spanish-American War, this was Spanish crown lands. Um, some of these upper lands have actually been under some form of protection since uh, Columbus landed on the island in 1498. So it's true old growth forest. Um, the Spanish crown lands had it, and everyone realized its value in terms of water supply. During the Spanish-American War, the Treaty of Paris, it was transferred referred to the U.S. Uh, DA actually before there was a forest service, and it was actually made one of the first forest services. So we are, it's been a research forest for many years, back in the 20s, Gleason and uh, Wadsworth and Holdridge and Odom in the 70s and the LTER work in the, since, the nine, since the late 80s. Um, so we're actually resting on shoulders of giants, um, which is very good for the CZO. It, it helps us. We're adding the geologic component that wasn't always done in the past. The other key point to remember is this upper part is really old growth forest, and so again, land use is fairly much um, mitigated. Okay, just to go a little bit for atmospheric inputs, we increase precipitation decrease ET as you go up. Um, so there's nice patterns as you go up. Our rainfall coming in is actually very clean maritime composition comes off of the Atlantic. Uh, these bar charts here, the B is one of our sites, shows how our chemistry relates to other montane tropical forests. Uh, very clean in terms of nitrogen and others. Um, so in many ways, this is a re good reference water said relatively undisturbed area. Strong environmental gradients also dominate this area. The top here in the cloud forest, where you see a little inversion on the day this was taken, uh, we get up to 5,000 millimeters of rainfall a year. Um, ET is much greater than precipitation, a uh, montane rainforest, cloud forest. The coast, and this can be anywhere from 10 to 12 miles as the crow flies, uh, dry forest, uh, 1,000 millimeters of ET in an individual year. Um, There we go. I mean, these maps just show what actual evapotranspiration is and uh, actual relative to precipitation. And you see there's some patterns there. And you can actually see the Hornfell peaks that are kind of ridging in some of these areas. A couple of characteristics about the area. Uh, great deal of rainfall, but we also get about three showers a day. Um, 
So a lot of light showers, which means there's a great deal of interception. We look at the water balance. We get a lot of water that hits and actually goes back up into the atmosphere. In this area, these low areas, we lose about 40 to 50 percent of the water will be intercepted in, a, in over a year. But when you get to the cloud forest, you get about 10 percent increase. You get cloud inputs. So this gradient of cloud inputs is quite important for us. Wind speeds actually are relatively low also. Um, if we think about hurricanes, they're dramatic, and we have terrible wind speeds. But if we actually look at mean daily, because of our graphic effects and others, our actual wind speeds are not outrageous. And that actually keeps our um, ET down to some extent. One of the first questions that we've been dealing with, the CDO has been dealing with, and all asking and asking ourselves is that we have all these different atmospheric inputs coming into the mountain. Here's the mountain. We have hurricanes, we have tropical storms, easterly waves, or graphic inputs. And the question is, what's the relative importance of these in terms of their hydrologic contributions, but also the nutrient contributions? And to make complete nutrient budgets and to really understand the mass fluxes, we want to get some sense of that. Work that Marsha Scholl has started with the CZO and is continuing on is by using um, isotropic tracers. And the colors here kind of give different types of storms. And you can see there's a nice seasonality to it without going into a great deal of detail. What's coming up is the emerging view in this area is that about 20, you know, 30, 35 percent of the rainfall that we get comes from daily orographic rains. Those are the three rains a day type business. What really controls those is coastal plain land use and the land-sea interactions. And I'll turn to this at the end. We'll see how that's a unifying theme. They also turn out to be quite important in terms of maintaining base flow in these areas, regardless of the rock type. The waves and the hurricanes um, are fairly more frequent. They tend to be controlled by more like the North America oscillation, the North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, bigger storms, maybe 30 percent of our rainfall. Hurricanes less frequent, clearly important in carving the landscape and in some of the dominant forces in terms of knocking down trees and what's related to the age distribution of the forest, but not so much for our total rainfall, um, 10, maybe 15 percent and then northern fort fronts also come. The key point I want to make is each of those, we'll come back to it, is slightly, has a different impact on the landscape, um, as well as a different frequency. I also mentioned that where our air is very, our water quality, air, rainwater quality is very pure. We're part of the Ashton National Deposition System. Um, and it turns out there that we have some of the best rain in the sequence, but we actually have very, very high mercury inputs and exports. And that's been a question that the CZO knew as we started, and a lot of the effort we've been doing has actually been going into looking, is it coming from mines, is it coming from lithology, we're trying new tracer studies. And what you can see in these bar graphs is a number of sites from Vermont and Colorado, and um, basically we're much higher than all of them. And it turns out it has to do with our tropical locations. And we'll see some of that pieces together as we come. Okay, so we have lithologies, go up and down the mountain. We have these different rainfalls. We also have four forest types um, that come up and have been identified over the years. And more or less change as you go up in elevation uh, because of rainfall that have been related to rainfall and cloud cover. Um, and there's an elephant and a palm forest, mostly dominated by palms. Um, and these two lower forests. So the question comes, in a sense, is with all this complexity, we have difference in geology. We have difference in forest type. We have difference in rainfall. And obviously, there's some relationship between rainfall and forest type um, and soils. How do we actually tease apart these relative differences? So we've aimed, again, at the volcanic caustics and the quartz diorite, and then um, also the horn fells, we can't ignore that. 
Um, and the first example I'll talk about is how we've done it, and we've done it by doing a systematic soil sampling. And it's what we call the Lokio Critical Zone Soil Network. Um, it really means students and a professor, Art Johnson in the middle there, a couple postdocs, a lot of rain and mud, and a lot of ending up with about 247 quantitative soil pits, where we sampled systematically by forest type, by rock type, by slope position. I also mentioned that ridge, I haven't mentioned, but ridge, slope, and valley with any individual area we know is a strong determinant of vegetation and soil and groundwater movement. Um, then you also have elevation per forest type and replicates. As you start looking at all these combinations, the minimum that you can get, and really we just did two rock types, it's about 240 pits. Um, we've sampled those, and at the moment we're actually going through and um, some of them are being used for master's theses, some for PhD theses. Um, I'll just give you an example of some of the data that's actually coming out of it, and we hope to have a series of papers coming out next year in, a, in ecosystems. But let's first just look at carbon concentration, and this is by bedrock and forest type. So we're not looking at uh, different landscape positions, but if we look at the three forest types, Palm, Colorado, and Tabanuco, each case, we have our two bedrock, bedrocks, the quartz diorite or the ground, di ground diorite is here. Um, this is percent carbon. What you see in each case is in the volcanoclastics, it's slightly larger. And in some places, it's very distinct. Um, but in each case, um, the mean and the median lines, basically, you get more in the volcanoclastics. That makes complete sense because they have much more um, clay and the clay binds the organic matter, and there's good mineralogical reasons for that. And that's not too much of a surprise. And so even if you can control by forest type or control by elevation, you see similar patterns. If we go again and look at bulk density of the rock material, and again, now we're looking at 0 to 20 centimeters, and we can do this down to 80 centimeters. Um, looking again at the, the range of them, the box plots, turns out now that the granodiorite or quartz diorite has higher bulk densities in each of these cases. And again, that makes complete sense. The sand, and these can be up to 60% sand, maybe even higher in some places, is heavier than the clays. Um, the clays are much more, um, just the bulk, the specific gravity of them is heavier, but also the, uh, the, the packing and the basic structure of the clay soils tends to be that the, the quartz granodiorite ones are much more um, packed. The point is when you put these together and actually start looking at content of carbon, so multiplying the bulk density by the concentration to get kilograms per meter squared, um, actually it removes a lot of the differences. Uh, one has more concentration but lighter soils, the other less concentration heavy soils. Um, and so you start seeing, again, considerable similarities between the two. Interesting story in the sense that if you don't combine these, they're basically landscape convergence. At some level, you get some of the same patterns, but they're getting there by different ways. Um, as we continue on, again, another quick example here for looking at total phosphorus. So a lot of the work we've been doing now is not only sampling these ways by looking at landscapes and hill slope positions, et cetera, but then coming up with landscape multivariate techniques to help us to separate those and then look to see if there's differences in geology or hydrology, et cetera. This is actually one for total um, phosphorus, all the phosphorus in the, in the sample um, from 0 to 80 centimeters. And what you see is that there's, again, a very large difference between the volcanoclastics and the quartz diorite. In a sense, about 55% of the variance up to 66% can be explained just by rock type. Um, the volcanoclastics have a higher mean than the quartz diorite. 
Can mineralogical difference make sense because of the clays and the binding capacity of the of the others? When you start looking at hill slopes, volcanoclastics actually there is a difference in the hill slope position between the amount of uh, phosphorus is there. But then as you look at the for the quartz diorite, the, the hill slope position really is not a factor. And you can look at the relative importance here. The key thing I want to make it, make here is that by separating sampling this way and then doing some statistics, you start to get a sense of how these things vary across the landscape. And one of the emergency, emerging views we're getting is at least for soils now, the landscape variables in most cases can explain maybe 20 to 30 percent of the variance. And we're talking about lithology, landscape, slope, curvature. Um, surely it's much better for some things that are abiotic than it is for biotic things. Um, when we add the biotic component, stand age, type of vegetation, forest type, Again, hill slope position, which is again related to stand age. Um, we can start explaining 60 to 70 percent of the variation out there, um, which it turns out to be related to precipitation and decomposition rates. One of the issues that is again emerging is, is that we look at ridge tops, lithology and stand age, and that's really just how long that forest has been there, when was the last time there were tree uproots. Um, that's really the dominant predictor of what's there and what kind of soil and what kind of permeabilities you have. As you get into the valleys here, it turns out that water, water accumulation, water saturation drives soil oxygen, drives redox. That in stand age actually turns out to be a much more important position. And again, because of max, max flux from one place to the other. Um, a lot of work going on, kind of looking at ridge slope and valley sequences, and some work by Hall and Silver has been doing that. One of the models that we're coming up with in testing, um, again, is this hill slope catena idea. And the ideas of hill slope catenas, ridge slope and valley, and kind of a general connected mass transport from the hill slopes down to the valley. It's been known in soil scientists for a while. It actually was first developed um, in East Africa in very similar environments. What we see in this landscape is there are these differences. If we look at one area where we hold climate constant, hold bed, bedrock constant, we surely see differences on ridges than we do on valleys. The ridges actually have some of the oldest trees, uh, the valleys some of the youngest. Sounds a little counterintuitive in this hurricane environment, but it turns out that uh, if the hurricanes actually structure there, the dominant control of the trees and the mortality for the ridges, but many of these trees lose their branches early, they don't uproot, um, they, um, and the hurricanes don't occur as often as tree falls and landslides in the valley. So you get this age separation. Um, Soil organic matter actually gets controlled quite well on it. And you get a nice kind of balance between these ridges and valleys. Again, what controls the dynamics of them, uh, which again feeds back into the hydrologic cycle and the biogeochemical cycle. And the maps here again show that ridge, slope, and valley turn out to be very good predictors of what our landscape is. Okay, that's kind of giving us a sense of the upper part of the soils. Um, I know I'm kind of rushing through some of these things. We can come back to any of them if you want. As we go down in the soil profile, we're starting out with two different rock types. And it becomes obvious we really need to understand this weathering this weathering, and how do we get from rocks to soil, um, ultimately to, and then ultimately how these rocks come. This picture here is, Fairly typical, it's actually from the quartz diorite. Um, these are core stones, you actually see some weathering rinds on them, and then they're actually weathered, this big weathering profile. We've been looking, the what, geochemists and all of us have been actually looking at kind of what these contributions are. Quite interesting that there's been a great deal of work on nutrient cycling done at the site for years. 
but no one ever really knew what the rock contributions were. They were actually always done by um, kind of a difference. Well, we know what's coming in, what's going out. I guess everything else is coming from weathering. Um, now, for the first time, we're actually doing this. And we have this general idea that you can see a little bit in this picture that you have bedrock. It gives us these large core stones weathering around them. Those ultimately weather, and as they go into smaller ones, you get more soil. The size of them is going to be then related to how quickly they weather. Where your streams cut across this landscape, down in the lower part here and the upper part, should give you different chemistry because there are going to be different weathering stages. Uh, we're testing that, and it actually seems to be working to some extent. To do that, again, we've drilled some wells. We just drilled three last summer. We're hoping to get two more this summer um, and considerable ways now. And again, these are things that are using. We're doing it by rock type. They're being used by the hydrologist to look at deep water movement. They're being used by the geochemist uh, to look at this weathering rind and how, how we actually weather things as we move up the cycle. Uh, they're being used by the biogeochemist. Again, a whole, whole range of people are trying to get as much out of these. Just show you, um, these are two from the volcanic plastics. We see there's a great deal of movement up in this upper surface. Uh, landslides are an issue. Um, but the general pattern does seem to be holding. We surely know the deeper ones down here are much less weathered. So there is this weathering kind of uh, conveyor belt system that's moving up. Um, the other part of this that becomes increasingly intriguing is that as we look down at these weathering profiles, they're actually much deeper than the local channel. And this is a cross-section of where these areas were taken in the Beasley watersheds. Our weathered surface is much deeper than the local channel surface. So the, the, the movement of water down into the stream channel is not actually controlled from the hill slopes down to the bottom here. It's going much deeper. And even in these very dense clays where it's hard for, you can see they're very dense here, um, What's controlling the weathering front is not necessarily the incision of the channel. And again, that weathering front zone and channel profile are slightly different. And that hopefully will come clear as we get to the end. OK, so we see some differences in weathering rates in soils. Now, as we move down, it's the streams, or the second, and it's I find it intriguing that of everything we've looked at in terms of soil differences and bedrock differences, the streams are the ones that in some ways actually show some of the greatest differences. Um, and I showed you those earlier pictures before. You know, the quartz diorite and the volcanoclastics are quite dramatic. This is actually a quartz, uh, the volcanoclastic streams. We're very lucky here that because we have three rains a day, rains all year round, we get a lot of pulses, a lot of big storms. This right, these same place, these two streams, um, same bend going around. Um, you really don't see, this is a very common occurrence. This is a, you know, couple of times a month type of event. It's giving us great opportunity to do some storm chasing. And a range of people are working on this. Um, won't go too much in the details. I will say that we're seeing between the rock types, um, there is a slight difference in the response time. The sandier soils have a slightly longer response time for rainfall. But it's not dramatic. Everything is very wet. If we get to bigger streams, the, the, the response times are not that dramatic. What is dramatic, though, are the magnitudes of the exports. And the quartz diorite, the volcanoclastics can have five times as much export of one thing. The other can have five times as much export as the other. The lithology of the streams also turns out to be um, quite dramatic in this idea that the streams have the kind of strongest lithologic input um, is intriguing. 
you can just grand size here. The volcanic classics have, you know, much coarser fragments and then no fines, and the others have mostly fines. We see that in stream slope profiles and uh, very clear. And again, it has to do with transport capacity and a whole range of things. One of the interesting things that's come up from the CZO, and I say this somewhat um, humorously, but I like it because it really shows the, the power of the CZO methodology. What's turning out to be one of the conceptual things that no one really thought about at the beginning, but it has to do with boulders. And in fact, in the proposal, it's not a big thing. But as we started meeting and talking, we realized a whole range of us were actually studying boulders. The deep weathering group was studying the weathering of the soil rinds. In the streams, we're looking at transport capacity. Soils, we don't like boulders because they make calculating bulk density very difficult. Um, we got people looking at sediment transport by Colin here doing something. Um, the production and development and change of them is something that all the groups are actually doing independently. So now that we've actually started looking at it, we have much more, uh, we're changing ideas and getting different ways to measure them that the stream people were doing versus the, the soil people. And so again, it's a, just a nice example of how these type of interactions come up and you don't actually quite uh, anticipate. Okay, so we've talked about atmospheric inputs, getting our streams down. I want to point out that this is the Lukeo Mountains and this is an infrared. The, green, the red is vegetation. We are not an ivory tower. We're surely surrounded by people. Um, each of these streams, there's eight major streams that come across. They go across the, the coastal plain. Um, one of the concerns that the LTR and, other, and the Forest Service has is, is this ultimately going to become a central park and we're just going to be surrounded by urbanizations? Um, the influence of, my, my, of this on rainfall and migrations of organisms, it's a clear issue. For us, it's for the CZO, it's also a big issue of how transport changes. You know, you see a lot of boulders up here and not too many down here. There's some mysterious place where the boulders are disappearing, there are changes in uh, land issues you go, go across. Also, it, as we look at this picture of the um, physiographic image of Puerto Rico, here's the Luqueo Mountains again. The coastal plain is really the dominant, uh, full of people and pasture. Um, where our water supply is used for, where our taxes come to actually do this work is actually based on the coastal plain. That interaction is increasingly important. Um, we do know that there's some very dramatic differences in the energy budgets and the fluxes between these areas. Um, the lowland tends to have much more higher latent, or the pasture has uh, its latent heat of evaporation is much hotter than, much higher than the forest. Um, and some of these areas surprisingly actually trans transpire a great deal. The heat fluxes down here are different than they are in the adjacent forest, and surely different when we come up into the urban areas here. And so as we start looking at these, one of the questions become, at this larger scale, how do, how do these actually influence our mass flows? And again, how, they, how do the different rock types different, uh, differ on these? And that's what this ultimate model is showing. We have a cross-section of Lukeo. We know tectonic uplift has been important. Some of our coastal uh, sea level rise work is trying to get a handle on that. Um, but we also know that we've changed the energy flux along the coastal plain here. And that actually has a large influence on our daily rains and basically land-sea interactions. And as we've heated up this, we've actually changed the land-sea interactions to ultimately dry out the forest, um, where, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have these two large type of systems. We have the large hurricanes, the large synoptic systems that come in, and then we have our daily rains. These kind of orographic rains make up 30 or so percent of our rainfall, they're very important for maintaining the base flow, 
and even more so on the volcanic plastics and the quartz diorites, they seem to be most strongly influenced by our local land use on the coastal plain. The hurricanes, the others, um, are really dominated by sea surface temperatures, um, hurricane you know, global patterns, really what the North Atlantic Oscillation is doing, what the sea surface temperature in the Atlantic is doing. They are much bigger storms. They're the ones that are actually causing the physical sculpting of the landscape, changing stream channels, causing landslides. So again, it's those interacting, interactions of the two onto the different rock types that are actually giving us the um, kind of landscape. And this one shows us again that you have the coastal plain, we have these foothills. What the cosmogenic group is really trying to do is give us some age constraints on these. We know they're different erosion surfaces. Um, some of them are related to lithology, much more tends to be a kind of elevator tectonic story. Um, the soils don't seem to make that much difference. They seem to be related much more to the modern processes. Drainage density may be related to others. Um, kind of an emerging view. Okay, let me summarize here because we can open up for questions as I understand uh, is, the, is the standard here. First, the observatory approach has been very powerful, very useful, getting groups together uh, the biogeochemist, the you know, geochemist, the hydrologist, having a nice conceptual theme like the two different rock types has been very useful for us. Um, having coordinated sampling and some hypothesis testing, um, again, on these broad ideas has been very, very useful for bringing people together. Um, and it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about these differences. Boy, it's surely something else to actually sit down and write a paper about them and having the formality of the CZO and the LTERs have been very useful for that. Well, some of the emerging ideas, again, about lithology and biology, the example I saw about the total soil storage, I think is a nice one, and that lithology, there's a clearly a difference when you add the biology in there and, the, and some of the things that control bulk density, the mineralogy, there's a convergence. You don't get nearly as much difference between the two. We're beginning to see that in a number of things, that there's a difference in rock types, but then once you put on forest types, there's maybe some landscape convergence. Um, as one of my many old mentors used to say, there's many ways to skin a cat. I think we're seeing that in some cases. But then as we go down deeper into the critical zone and look at rock types, there's clearly some differences. Um, so again, it's this great challenge and fun challenge for us to learn how to separate the two. I think this kind of gradient sampling approach we're using is useful. The other thing that is coming, again, from all the sides, all the groups we've seen, the geochemists, uh, the stream people, the landslide vegetation, is landscape age, where you are on the landscape, ridge slope valley, um, upper surface, lower surface, has a very important influence on flow paths, on soil chemistry, et cetera. Um, age of that landscape, when the, last la earth, when the last landslide was, when the last tree flow, how old the trees are on top of it, are great predictors for looking at how much soil soil organic matter is, how much weathering there's been because of staying along older. Um, we hope, I think that's going to be one of the links that will help us link land form stability and landscape evolution, a key thing for all the critical zones, into kind of the biology, how they respond. Um, and our hope is by this kind of coordinated sampling, we'll be able to tease that apart. So I have here's a beautiful picture of Lucio again, and you can see the quartz diorite the little basin eroding a little bit faster than the everything else. Our horn fells tend to keep us up as we talk. Um, with that, I can open up to some questions if people have them. Um, I encourage you to look at our website. We've put a lot of effort into trying to make information available to people. Um, you know, all this is public information. You're all welcome to come and do things there, and I encourage you to 
to challenge us in dialogue. So, Todd, what do we do now? Well, th first I thank you. That was a uh, tremendous talk. Thank you. I learned a lot. And uh, Ying von Reinfelder has a question from Rutgers. Are the weathering depths different under the two rock types? Uh, good question. Um, there, there are, but they're less different than you would think. And first of all, even our wells, uh, we've gone down 30 to 40 meters. I don't think we've still found an unweathered piece of rock. And there's a six pack for anyone that has one that anyone will, I will buy that for anyone that, uh, can clearly demonstrate. We find some fresh rock, but, um, it turns out that the quartz diorite has deeper landslides and in some ways it's possibly shallower bedrock. It's weathering much faster. Um, the volcanic clastics, they're very deep and so, if we look at things like flow depths, if soil depths, depth to the top of the saprolite, there's clearly differences. Um, and it tends that the quartz diorite tends to be a little shallower and eroding faster. Well, I have a quick question. How deep are the water tables usually? Are they significant or do they fluctuate a lot? Or That's another interesting point about this. Most of our water table actually starts from the top down. And so we have a great deal of rain. Um, I'd like to go back to my Katina thing. Many of our wells um, do not have water in them many times. And so and these are dense clays. So our hydrologic budget, for, especially from the, the volcanic plastics, don't show a great deal of groundwater loss. And if it is, it's fairly shallow in the top meter. Once we look at our permeabilities, you get down to a meter or two and it's hard for water to get down here. There is some water down here at 30 meters and occasionally we get some. We think it's old water. I mean, we're, that's one of the, these wells have just been drilled. That's going to be one of the exciting things to find out about it. But what's cool, so the valleys are almost always saturated and the water table is very shallow. Um, as you drill down here, you rarely get any. But we kind of think of the water table starting from the top down in the sense when we have heavy rains, basically you saturate things and you can get ponded water even on the ridge tops and then you'll go down and you get, then you get a modeling zone and then you get dry conditions underneath, um, except for the valley. So groundwater is not a big issue here. A um, little bit bigger for the quartz diorite, but I, I think, so the water table is, it does fluctuate, but it seems to be much more controlled kind of from the upper surface. Well, Ying Fan has another follow-up question. Is the groundwater flow below and parallel to the rivers? Ah, uh, you got it? one of my favorite questions. Um, and we don't, I won't give you a 100% answer. In the headwaters, like we are here, this picture actually shows the saprolite. Um, there's a great deal of shallow groundwater flow, and so most of the water is coming into the right into the streams um, in that top meter. And so I would say the groundwater flow um, is not below, but it's parallel to the streams. There's got to be some deeper water going that's controlling this deeper saprolite weathering surface. Um, but most of it, if well, we have every year, let me put it this way, every year we have maybe a week without rain, and almost all the streams start to dry, to dry out, even the big ones. So there's not a great deal of storage up there or a great deal of groundwater input. Um, How deep are the roots then, of the trees? Uh, pretty shallow because there's no reason to go deep. So many people on the, you know, on the Amazon, we've shown that they go down, you know, five meters, ten meters. Here, most of it's about a meter. Um, there's no reason to go down for water. We've got plenty of water. In fact, most things show that the more water you have, the less soil oxygen you have, the more landslides you have. So, you know, there's no reason to go down for water. The nutrients are actually relatively rich, too. And as we go to a lot of places in Central America, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, where we've done some comparative studies. Nutrients are not lacking. 
So the root zones, instead of going down, they tend to go out. And a lot of trees have buttresses. The game is to keep from falling over, being blown over by a hurricane or being turned over by a landslide. Um, so our root zone is shallow, and we think most of what's happening is happening in that top meter. Uh, Everglades in a tropical climate, they have a lot of invasives. Do you see anything like that in terms of insects or um, mammals or plants or anything? Uh, fascinating question. And so if we go back to the coastal plain, um, for the island of Puerto Rico, some of the dominant species are um, invasive non-natives, and surely the coastal plain is. Um, and there are a couple that have been pests. I mean, there are many that are there. They're not really causing too many problems. Uh, humans are the great invasives everywhere. Um, for the forest, though, it's surprising that they've, they actually, um, they're, they're less. They tend to be along roads. Um, there's some that come, and then we have the next big hurricane, and the natives can outcompete them. Um, things that do do fairly well, like teak, come from other hurricane areas. Um, bamboo is one that's migrating in certain places. The general story is that when you keep the forest intact, it's very hard for the invasives to outcompete. When we build a road or we deforest, then we give the invasives a nice um, advantage. That's come up with this idea that uh, the new ecosystems, these are clearly different ecosystems than they were before but the forest has basically maintained itself, and uh, so invasives are not nearly as problematic. There are invasive worms and things that go all the way up, but um, not, not terrible. Other questions? I have a few more, and, but please feel free to ask if you have anything. You mentioned earlier the mercury was higher there. I, I didn't catch what you were thinking. Okay, and I guess because I didn't explain it very well. Um, so we were all very proud of how clean our water, air was, and acid rain. We were always, you know, the best, and I mean, we know that it, that it's actually um, good. And then all of a sudden, uh, Jamie and others started looking at mercury, and we turned turned out to be some of the highest. What shows on this graph on the right is if you actually go along the U.S., it does tend to get higher in the, toward the tropics. And unfortunately, there are not that many places in the tropics, but Florida is much higher. It seems that that's a general pattern, and it seems to have to do with the way mercury, it's anthropogenic mercury, it gets up into the upper atmosphere, and it hangs out in the lower atmosphere. There are times of year when our rainfall, when we get these inversions, where we actually in pins, or where the rainwater source comes, is basically from that same zone is where mercury is accumulating in the upper atmosphere. Um, the test we're trying now with a PhD student is to look at beryllium as a tracer. We know that from Martha's work, we're printing from the cloud top work, we think that's where the water is coming from. We're trying to get the tracers. What we've done now is systematically kind of eliminated other sources. There were old mines there. We went and we looked and sampled them, and there's no mercury left. There were, there were placer mines near the streams. That's all been turned over. Uh, lithology, there's a little difference, but most of it's at the contact zone, so that's not doesn't explain the rainwater impacts. Surely doesn't explain what we're seeing in the streams. And in fact, there the lithology is about the same, it seems to be the biology. Um, so we don't know. We think, though, that it's going to be this climate picture, and um, it's kind of back to this last idea that I have. These are It's being caused by some synoptic system that's coming outside of the local influence. Hmm. Well, John, you have a question? Yeah, what's the relationship between the lithology and landslides? Uh, many, many more are on, on the quartz diorite. They're deeper. Total yield is much greater. Percent of yield 
any number you come up with, it's bigger. Bigger, deeper. Um, the only, the, the, the clays have maybe slightly higher number, an equal number, um, they're, but they're very shallow. They go down a meter, maybe go down two meters. Um, they take steep, <laughs> steeper slopes. Um, they, it's all that water just kind of runs off in this upper meter uh, through very dense networks where the quartz diorite, it goes down deeper, it probably hits this weathering zone and these boulders, um, but much more in the quartz diorite. Almost anything you can think of or more. And there's a question, Kwasi, a follow-up on the uh, mercury. Is He's asking if the mercury results could be attributable to the strong environmental gradient shown. Um, we don't think so because at one point we thought, well, maybe they're being caused by some things on the other, on another adjacent island. Maybe they're, um, it's you kind of have a good point there if I can get back to that first. Um, we don't think so. I, we think it's coming from these, these upper sources here. Like the, we, the rainfall mercury you get here and here is not that much different. You just get more rain up here, so you get more mercury, but the concentrations are not outrageous. Um, we've tried to think, well, is it a local source, and it doesn't seem to be. It seems to be when we're getting rain from the upper, the lower part of um, above this tropical train winds inversion. But I can tell you that story could change. But I think that's, we, we pretty much know it's not from San Juan, not from the Virgin Islands, not from the local, and we know the concentrations are coming the same at the top and the bottom. A lot of tropical systems have the slash and burn agriculture where fire is important. Does that yeah. show up at all in, I guess? At, I'm interesting. We're so wet that we don't think there are fires down in the coastal plain, yes. Other parts of Puerto Rico, yes. Um, slash and burn, even in the past, slash and burn, they couldn't do that much slash and burn because, you know, three rains a day, it's hard to get a fire going. Um, and, you know, after hurricanes, I was worried. I thought the whole place was going to catch on fire, and the fire guy said, no way. You know, this is just too wet. We've seen a few rains, fires along roads. Um, it does but the fear is as we dry things out, that fire zone is going to move up the mountain. There's clearly, um, it's clearly true. Question Joel here, um, what does the quartz diorite weather, why does the quartz diorite weather faster? Is it because the hydrology clays above the, uh, good question. Um, it weathers faster because once the feldspars and things are exposed, they just fall apart. But I think you're exactly right. It weathers, there are more landslides, and so we're exposing the soil surface much quicker where the clays have been eroding. So you have to go down tens of meters to get to new bedrock. And so there's kind of this idea of the clays being armored, uh, the clays above the volcanic clastics. I think that's right. I think they weathered very fast. And then now they have this thick horizon that runs off. And the quartz diorite keeps on having landslides, and so we keep on um, exposing stuff. Um, and that's, that's generally the idea. And you kind of see why you go back. Uh, it's clearly that you see, if, uh, yeah. The valley here is clearly the quartz diorite that does erode faster. The hornfells tend to be the ridge formers, and they erode. It's clear they erode less. They're very dense. Um, it's not, you know, that you have the quartz diorite, the intrusion impacting the volcanic clastics, giving you the hornfells, and they're not in the middle in terms of any characteristic. They're, it's not. These are not additive processes. I had another question as well. Sure. This is Joel Moore. Um, you said there are plenty of nutrients in the soils, um, in the upper soils. For the, does that include the non-organic nutrients? 
And if so, where are they coming from since you have the thick saprolite? Sure. In both locations. Um, in general, if we look at the total nutrients coming in rainfall and in the soils, um, they're, they're high. It's not like all the nutrients are held in the biomass like in some of the cratonic places of the Amazon. Um, one example of that for landslides, you can have the landslides in the quartz diorite down to bedrock, I mean, you're down to deep saprolite, you know, no organic matter. You can build up that forest in 50 years to have the same biomass as the adjacent undisturbed area. The calcium that you need to build that up will come in from rainfall. You don't have to weather anything. You do weather, but just to say that the rainfall inputs are high. The things like P and N, there's enough organic matter there that and there's plenty of binding places. That even the quartz diorite, even if it's 60% sand, there's still a lot of clays and there's a lot of binding places. And we have a lot of organic matter. And it, all the stuff that the, we're looking at, people have done, of looking at how, much, how many binding sites there are in those clays, you can bind a lot more nutrients. So it's not a lack of holding stuff. We have plenty coming in, plenty of weathering. Um, so it's hard to show nutrient limitations. And we haven't done it for everything, but surely for all the major ones, um, there's plenty around. Does that okay, answer thanks. what you were asking? Yes, yep, definitely. Thank you. We're almost out of time here. If I can squeeze another question in. Um, in climate change, I mean, can you see any long-term effects of um, uh, either drought or rainfall trends? Uh, interesting, and that's really kind of what it's all about in a sense. Um, and one of the concerns that we've come up with this idea of the local rainfalls and how they impact, we've seen things get drier. Um, and surely it, some of it has to do with deforesting the coastal plain, changing cloud base. And some of our models show that, um, you know, we're still working it out, but I think that's true. Terms, of, and we do know things are drier. We know the coastal plains drier. It's warmer. Um, I think we have to look internally. We don't necessarily have to change the world um, to blame a lot of this stuff. Um, surely changing from forest to pasture makes a huge difference. In terms of hurricanes, we're right in the middle here. No major evidence there's been a change in frequency or uh, magnitude. Surely frequency, we have good records back to the 1400s. Um, and I think the other work that people are doing is showing somewhat similar. There have been periods when there have been more or less. Um, oddly, if we get a warmer ocean, we actually will see the hurricanes turn up more we might see more along the east coast of the U.S. We may actually see less in Puerto Rico. And there's some evidence from the whole scene that that might be true. Um, you know, more hurricanes and more droughts is kind of the worst case scenario for us. Um, less hurricanes and more droughts may not be great. But so far, because we're surrounded by water, um, the local changes seem to dominate anything we see from global change. We've seen some changes, but they don't seem to be nearly as great as we see from our local land use change. And the other one I didn't mention is um, taking water off the landscape. We're taking a lot of water off and sending it to San Juan. The amount of that we remove from our streams is much greater than any climate change scenario that you can come up with. Oh, very good. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This was a great presentation. Look forward to seeing you again next week, if possible. And thank you, Fred, for doing this. Oh, happy to do it. And I always like to talk about Lucio. Great. Okay. Take care very now. Very good. Thank you, Fred, very much. So this is, gonna, this is recorded someplace. So if people want to look at it, where can I tell them to go? Or Yes, absolutely. So... Or you can give us, send us a link and we'll put it on our website.